Thank you, Sister Logan. For the, my message this morning, <clears throat> we're continuing to consider the matter of the fall of Babylon. And what I wanted to point out in this text that Sister Logan read is that this is, uh, this is not a done deal yet. I mean, as far as, as far as Babylon is concerned, this is not just ancient history that we're talking about. <clears throat> the Lord has not forsaken his people, even though you may look around you and it may look like that sometimes. He has not forsaken his people, though there has been sin in his land. He has not forsaken his land. He has not forsaken his people, and there is vengeance yet to come on Babylon. He will render unto her a recompense. <clears throat> if, you, if, you, if you have uh, looked at the schedule I printed several months ago, um, I had planned on entitling this message, The Prophets Foretold the Fall of It, but I want to change my title just a little bit because as I... Uh, studied this and began to write it down, it kind of took a slightly different direction. So the, the title of my message this morning is The Prophets Foretold It. Not only the fall of it, but the captivity itself. <clears throat> this is a, a very great matter in the scriptures. The more that I study this, the more this becomes uh, obvious to me that this is not the, the matter of Babylon, the Babylonian captivity, the matter of spiritual Babylon spoken of in the book of the Revelation, this is not like some little isolated thing off on the side that just uh, maybe a few people might know about. This is a very prominent matter in Scripture. And I want to bring that out today. <clears throat> but of course, this is not the kind of subject that they talk about in Babylon. <clears throat> this is not one of the popular themes running through the churches today. You won't find rows and rows of books on the fall of Babylon in the Christian bookstores. You will find rows and rows of books from Babylon, but not about Babylon. <clears throat> All around we see the goods that she is promoting, and we see the fruit and results of her fornications, but hardly anyone speaks about Babylon herself. That's because she is incognito. She is a spirit sent by Satan, so she's not perceived by those that have been taken captive by her. <clears throat> Why would Babylon teach the people about being captives, or about her own fall, or about God's purpose for her, and about her methods of operation? See, Satan is the one promoting this. It is of Satan, so it stands to reason that his religious institution has no knowledge of his operations, therefore they cannot speak about it or teach it. Satan does not cast out Satan. But now in the kingdom of God, our Lord does not operate like this. He's not secretive about his purpose and about his ways. He de in, fa in fact, he declares the end from the beginning. Amen. Before he even begins the work, he tells his people, here's what I'm going to do. See if, see if anyone can stop me. <clears throat> Part of his covenant is that his people will know him and delight in him, and follow him. And one of the things that the Lord has told us about is Babylon. So today I want to establish that this is a great matter in Scripture. This is not something mentioned just in one or two places. This is not like just a, a hobby horse that I have, or that we have here. It's, Babylon's not a little hobby horse. This is a, a, a prominent and a great issue in the Scripture. <clears throat> Babylon continues to be the arch rival of the true people of God, and it figures prominently in God's purpose. Yet scarcely any church people in our day have any knowledge of the Babylonian system that they are operating in. The captivity of ancient Israel was foretold, as well as the fall of Babylon. In fact, the fall was foretold even before the captivity happened. And the fact that Babylon is going to fall was repeated by the prophets during the captivity. And long after the captivity was over, centuries later, the Apostle John tells us again in the book of the Revelation that great Babylon is yet to fall. It might seem, now if you read Revelation, 
there's uh, chapter 14, 16, 17, and 18, it might seem that all of a sudden this subject of Babylon just kind of pops up out of nowhere because you don't, you don't hear Jesus and the apostles say anything about Babylon. And here, all of a sudden, in the end of Scripture, the apostle John brings up this issue of Babylon. You might have thought, well, that's ancient. That's way back hundreds of years ago, ancient history. Why is he talking about that? <clears throat> but there is a connection between these two Babylons, ancient Babylon and spiritual Babylon, which exists in the present day. Both are empowered by and are expressions of the devil, and both are used by God to judge his people. Ancient Babylon was judged by God and came to an end, and present-day spiritual Babylon will too. The fact that spiritual Babylon is going to fall was exemplified when ancient Babylon fell and that according to the prophets. The captivity of the people of Judah, the people of God, was prophesied. The prophets warned that if the people departed from serving God, God's people would be removed from their own land. They would go to live in a strange land, a land that was not home, that was not comfortable, that was not conducive to living for God. They would be surrounded by opposition, Opposition against God and against themselves because of their identity with God. They would be restricted and oppressed by the contrary spirit all around them. They would be deprived of their kings and rulers. But they were told, build houses. In other words, the, the prophet said, get used to this. Build houses, plant gardens, take wives, have children. This is the way it's going to be for a while. And a lot of them died in the Babylonian captivity. <clears throat> However, they were not to mingle with the people that they lived among. They were not to intermarry nor adopt their strange gods or their customs. Now this was foretold. <clears throat> not only was the captivity foretold, but also the deliverance of the people of God and the fall of Babylon. God has spoken both frequently and clearly on this issue. The magnitude of what he said in his word on the subject continues to grow. I am first going to establish by use of scripture that this is a great matter and that the people of God should not be surprised by the present state of the churches. Listen to the certainty with which Moses speaks when he tells Israel about the captivity that was to come after his death. Deuteronomy 4, beginning at verse 25, When thou shalt beget children, and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God, to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but ye shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord will lead you. And there ye shall serve gods or the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell." Now you notice in this text I just read, you don't hear the word if one single time. It says when this happens, it shall happen, and this here is what the Lord shall do. Now there were times when Moses and Joshua like presented choices before the people. Choose this day whom you are going to serve, for example. But in this text, we, we're not reading about a choice. This is, Moses is prophesying that the, this people were going to be taken captive. <clears throat> now there is, he does use the word if in the very next verses, Deuteronomy 4, verse 29, but if from thence, that is in the place where you're taken captive, if from there thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou shalt seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul, when thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he sware unto them. So now here's a choice. 
choice wasn't whether or not the people were going to Babylon. That was, that was set in stone. The if was, are you going to call in the name of the Lord now? In this captivity, if you call, he'll hear you. So then, according to Moses' word, the matter of being removed from the land and going into captivity was a matter of fact, and the only question was whether the people would seek the Lord in the captivity and in the tribulation. Now, Moses here didn't, didn't say the word Babylon or Assyria, but this, that is, in fact, what he's talking about here. <clears throat> Even before the people went into the promised land, it was told them that they would be removed from it. <clears throat> He did not say, if you depart, but when you depart from God, these things will happen. <clears throat> and the Lord confirmed these things to Moses himself again in Deuteronomy chapter 31 <clears throat> at verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought, in that they are turned unto other gods. I don't want to jump ahead of myself too much, but you just use this to assess the present day situation. <clears throat> I would not doubt that Jesus said something very similar to this to the Apostle Paul as he opened up the truth to him. And Paul taught the churches accordingly. And we know Jesus did say these things in a manner to the other apostles on the, uh, in the Olivet Discourse. Why are the churches in our day such a reproach to the name of the Lord? How did this happen? You might look out and survey the situation and say, how could things have gotten so bad? Well, we don't have to theorize about this. This is a matter of scriptural record. It's because they rose up and went whoring after the world around us and forsook God. Now God has judged the churches and forsaken them just like he said he would. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. <clears throat> learning includes being warned of what we see in the past. God should not have to tell us, if you go whoring after the world, I will forsake you and you will be devoured. We should be able to read the scriptural record and already know that. <clears throat> Paul should not have had to write to the Corinthians and tell them how to deal with a fornicator in the church. They should have already known that. <clears throat> This was written for our learning. Nevertheless, God is merciful, and because he will be found to be righteous in his judgments, he sends his prophets rising up early, speaking, teaching, and protesting to the people. Early, even while Israel was still living in the promised land, the prophets spoke out warning the people. Before the captivity, during the reign of King Uzziah, this is... I calculate somewhere at least 150 years before anyone was taken captive to Babylon, and certainly long before Nebuchadnezzar was even born, Isaiah began to prophesy concerning Babylon. Also prophesying before the coming of the Babylonians were Hosea, Amos, Micah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and possibly Joel. Hosea, Joel, Amos, and Zephaniah did not use the word Babylon or Chaldeans, but, but they spoke about being taken captive and about the judgment of the Lord that would come upon the people with vivid language. <clears throat> Later, Jeremiah and Ezekiel would also prophesy specifically about Babylon, both before and during the captivity. All of these prophets, except for the, the four that I already named here, mentioned either Chaldeans or the Babylonians or Nebuchadnezzar, and some mention all three specifically by name in their writings. So what happened could not have been a surprise to anyone. <clears throat> Likewise, what has happened in the churches in our time should not be a surprise. I want to take, uh, I won't go into great detail. I'm not going to read a lot of text here, but I do want to briefly give a recap of what the prophets said 
concerning Babylon and beginning with Jeremiah. And I'll speak about uh, Isaiah a little bit later. But again, what I'm emphasizing here is this is, this is a great matter. This is a central issue in the scripture. This isn't some little side issue that we've decided to get on and, and get on a soapbox and, and preach about all of a sudden. This is a, this is a great matter in scripture. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 20, Jeremiah declares that God will give Judah to the king, give the king of Judah to Babylon. Jeremiah 21, to King Zedekiah, he says it is futile to fight against Babylon. Chapter 24, there's two baskets of figs. This is where the Lord tells him, some of the people that go captive, I'll be good, I'll do good to them because they're good, and other people won't make it because they're, as it says, they're naughty figs. <clears throat> Chapter 25, the prophet Jeremiah declares the Lord is going to use Nebuchadnezzar, his servant, to judge the nations. Chapter 27, all nations will serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Chapter 28, the Lord will put a yoke of iron on all nations to serve Nebuchadnezzar. Chapter 29, the captivity is going to be long. This is where he says, build houses, plant gardens, marry wives, have children. <clears throat> Chapter 32, the Lord will give Jerusalem and King Zedekiah to the king of Babylon. And also the promise is given that the people would be gathered again from all nations to Jerusalem. Chapters 34 through 44, chapter 46 and 49, Babylon is mentioned by name in all of these chapters in various contexts. And Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51 are one, over a hundred glorious verses of the fall of Babylon. Now if you ever you get discouraged about Babylon around you, I want to encourage you, just take some time and read Jeremiah 50 and 51. It'll get you rejoicing. The Lord tells you what he's going to do there. Then in Jeremiah 52, the last chapter of the book, the historical accounting of the coming of the Babylonians and the taking of Jerusalem is given. Now this is just Jeremiah. So you can see here, this isn't something off in a corner that we've kind of taken a pair of tweezers and plucked out of the scriptures. Let's go to Ezekiel, <clears throat> chapter 12. He says, Jerusalem will go into captivity. The city's laid waste, and this is going to happen soon, he says. Chapter 17 of Ezekiel, the king will die in Babylon. That's Judah's king. Chapter 19, the princes of Israel will be taken to Babylon. Chapters 21 and 24, the king of Babylon will come against Jerusalem. Ezekiel 23, the Babylonians will come against Israel because of Israel's whoredoms. Chapter 26, Tyrus will be given to Nebuchadnezzar. Ezekiel 29, 30 and 32, the land of Egypt will be given to Nebuchadnezzar. Micah said in Micah 4.10, Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. Habakkuk said in chapter 1, verse 6, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. Since Jeremiah and Ezekiel both lived up to and during the Babylonian captivity, a good part of their books have to do with Babylon in some way. Then we have Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Zechariah, Haggai, all which lived during and after the captivity. So we're, we're not surprised to read about Babylon or the captivity or the after effects of the captivity in the Holy Prophet's writings. Nearly all of the prophets spoke of something having to do with the Babylonian captivity. It's even spoken of in some of the Psalms. <clears throat> So we can see here that there is a great portion of scripture dealing with Babylon before the captivity or during it or the recovering after it, either directly dealing with it or indirectly. I would even go as far as to say that the Babylonian captivity is a central issue in the word of God. So much of the word of the prophets touches on Babylon because it's something that God wants us to know about. <clears throat> This is not just ancient history. God would not devote some insignificant chunk of history, would not devote this much of the scripture to something like that. <clears throat> now in the New Testament scriptures, 
When we read from Matthew all the way up to Jude, we only see the word Babylon three times. <clears throat> and it's almost like just in passing. No, no issue is made of it. I'll read them for you. Matthew 1.17, here the genealogy of Christ. It says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Just kind of passes over it. The second place is in Stephen's sermon in Acts 7. And actually Stephen's quoting from Amos. He says, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan figures which ye made to worship them and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. And then finally Peter sends greetings from some saints who live in geographical Babylon. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. So in, is from the New Testament scriptures, Matthew to Jude, that's all we hear about Babylon. Then all of a sudden in the book of the Revelation, where does this come from? This is a big issue all of a sudden. Babylon crops up in, in 14, 16, 17, and the entire 18th chapter is devoted to the judgment of Babylon. And 19th chapter, all of heaven rejoices because she was judged. So you, for, if you're not familiar with what God is doing, you might think, where, does, where is all this coming from in the book of the Revelation? <clears throat> well, now actually, the second thing I want to establish here is that Christ and the apostles did talk about Babylon. They just didn't use the word Babylon. They didn't define it or uh, identify it as specifically as we are here or as the angel revealed to John in Revelation. Here in, uh, you should be familiar with this from our study in the Olivet Discourse. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And then I'm going to kind of skip around to several verses here. Verse 10, Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Before, behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Isn't this a description of Babylon? Spiritual Babylon? That's exactly what he was talking about. He's describing things that we see taking places in the churches today under the influence of Babylon, which is deception, offense at the truth, false prophets, iniquity abounding in love, waxing cold, false, pro false Christ. He's speaking of a religious phenomenon here. He's not talking about the world. He's talking about a religious phenomenon, something going on in the churches, something going on among people who claim to be the people of God. <clears throat> and you'll also recall from the Olivet Discourse the last parables that Jesus gave. They, all, all of these three or four last parables had to do with people who professed to be the servants of God, but when Jesus came, they weren't ready. That's Babylon. <clears throat> Now, Paul writes to Timothy, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despiters of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. He, is he talking about the people in the bars? Having a form of godliness. He's talking about people in churches. Again, we're talking about a religious phenomenon here. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. Again in 2 Timothy 3.13, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
and chapter 4, verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall be turned away, and shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. He's talking about Babylon. And Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, that is the, the day of the coming of the Lord, shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Again, a, a religious phenomenon we're talking about here. <clears throat> You're familiar with the text. I won't read the rest of it there. Second Thessalonians 2. I also want to include some word from, words from Peter. Second Peter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in, that is secretly or privately, they'll, they'll bring in, that is where you're at, they'll bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And they won't be alone. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, <clears throat> whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. And again, Peter says, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and etc. You, again, you're familiar with these texts. <clears throat> Later on, 2 Peter 2, 18, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same, he is brought in bondage. For if after they have, they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse with them than in the beginning, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. He's talking about Babylon. <clears throat> John spoke of this. <clears throat> in matter, especially John's first epistle, you read this and you really get the strong impression that this is what John is doing, as we've discussed many times here. He's identifying sources. He's, he's actually, again, he doesn't use the word Babylon, but he's distinguishing between the true people of God and spiritual Babylon, which is a false church. <clears throat> Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. <clears throat> and Jude, here again, this brother wrote his entire book. Reread re it and you'll see this entire book is devoted to this issue of there's, there's falseness that's crept into the churches. And beware of this, brethren. Just a few excerpts from Jude. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, like Peter, he says, These are spots in your feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. And her mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. <clears throat> but, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. 
These be they who separate themselves, <clears throat> sensual, having not the Spirit. Now, Jesus and the apostles might not have used the word Babylon, <clears throat> but they certainly spoke and wrote about her. <clears throat> they were very concerned and gave diligence to warn the people of God, just like the ancient prophets, ro rising up early, warned Israel about departure from God. <clears throat> it isn't until we get to the book of Revelation that we learn that the phenomenon that they spoke of is called Babylon the Great, <clears throat> the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. In the book of the Revelation, heaven has a great deal to say about Babylon, and not the Babylon of the past, <clears throat> but the Holy Spirit speaks very expressly about spiritual Babylon. In chapter 14, quoting from Isaiah 21, <clears throat> declares that Babylon is fallen. Chapter 16 says that she came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. In chapter 17, John sees her as a whore riding upon a scarlet colored beast. In chapter 18, the entire chapter is devoted to the judgment of Babylon, which is future and is given in great detail there. And in chapter 19, heaven rejoices that she is finally judged. <clears throat> and all of this has nothing to do with Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> and ancient Babylon. <clears throat> the judgment of Babylon that we read about in Revelation is actually <clears throat> the complete fulfillment of the words of all the prophets concerning her. <clears throat> and truly, Jesus and the apostles were not quiet about the subject of Babylon. <clears throat> so then we can see that the subject of Babylon is found throughout Scripture. Satan revived what, what, was, what he worked in Nebuchadnezzar in ancient Babylon. He revived in spiritual form in spiritual Babylon, <clears throat> in the churches. Now, if you think that what Babylon has done to you is bad, then think about what it has done to the name of the Lord in the earth. <clears throat> so this is something on God's agenda. <clears throat> If it were not for what Jesus has done, there would be no church. The church belongs to Jesus. He purchased it with his own blood. The holy things belong to God. <clears throat> the sheep are his. And in ancient times, the issue was not so much the people as it was the, a matter of the things that belong to God, like his land. He called it the holy land and my land. And his city, the place where he put his name in Jerusalem, and the temple where he dwelt. See, these were things that belonged to him that Babylon came and, and spoiled and corrupted and defiled. <clears throat> now, the prophets were not quiet when Israel defiled the holy things, and they certainly were not quiet when Babylon defiled them either. And we're not going to be quiet about it. <clears throat> if he abhorred his own inheritance, do we think that he will ignore what Babylon has done? Now all these things are taken into consideration when the angel says to John, Come hither, and I will show you the judgment of the great horror that sitteth upon many waters. In other words, he says, Let me show you how the things spoken by the holy prophets are going to unfold in the earth. Come here and see what Isaiah and Jeremiah were speaking about. The mere volume of texts that speak of Babylon and the fall of it should be an indication to us of the magnitude of this matter. <clears throat> this is more than just ancient Hebrew history. The greatness of Babylon's influence and reign over the whole earth and the way that the Lord speaks of her judgment by the prophets <clears throat> indicate that this cannot be confined to just a small compartment of time in ancient history. And now I want to look at some things that Isaiah said. Again, just recapping <clears throat> some things in Isaiah's book. And the reason I saved him till last is because Isaiah, all of his prophecies have to do with the fall of Babylon. <clears throat> he, doesn't say, he doesn't say much, if any, about going into captivity, <clears throat> but he says a lot about the fall of it. As I, far as I can ascertain, now I, I might be wrong in my survey and assessments here, but as far as I can ascertain, the very first prophecy in scripture that contains the word Babylon, it's the prophecy of Babylon is about her fall, not about captivity. And that's Isaiah chapter 13. The very first time you hear about the, if you want to call it the Babylonian phenomenon, 
God's announcing it's going to fall. Isaiah, that's just like the Lord, isn't it? That's in Isaiah 13. Isaiah 14, the judgment of the king of Babylon, who had not even been born yet when Isaiah wrote these things or spoke these things. Isaiah chapter 21, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. From Revelation 18, he's quoting from Isaiah. Isaiah 47, the judgment on the virgin daughter of Babylon, that she will be destroyed. And Isaiah 48, he affirms that the Lord will do as he pleases with Babylon, and he will deliver his people from her. <clears throat> I take delight in this. <clears throat> Long before the captivity began, Isaiah prophesied that it was going to end and that God is going to judge Babylon. This is the Lord's way. <clears throat> this is how the Lord works. And this is one of the Lord's great mercies toward his people. Before calamity comes, many times he'll give a word about the deliverance from it before it even gets to you. <clears throat> Some of the prophets have had to wait a long time now to see their words fulfilled. You can see better why all of heaven rejoices in Revelation chapter 19 when, when Babylon's judged. See, these, these old holy prophets, they're still waiting for the Lord to do these things that they spoke. <clears throat> of course, it's the Lord's word that they spoke, so we know that he's going to do them. <clears throat> so now, when we get to Revelation chapters 17 and 18, we're not reading about some new phenomenon, not at all. <clears throat> the truth that Babylon still exists in some form, the truth that she is a harlot, the truth that she still exercises a great deal of influence in the earth, the truth that she has corrupted the church and is the arch enemy of the people of God, the truth that she is going to be judged of God and fall suddenly and with a great fall have already been established by the time we get to the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 18 is the culmination of everything having to do with Babylon. The judgment of Babylon is the judgment of the works of the devil. <clears throat> this is his work. It will be the time when the Lord reveals what she truly is. It will be the time when the words of the holy prophets will be fulfilled by God. It will be a time when the saints who refused her corruptions will be made known. And most importantly, God will be glorified. <clears throat> As it was stated in the text that we read, <clears throat> Sister Logan read from Jeremiah, it will be seen that he did not forsake his people. God has not forgotten anything, and his word is truth. There really is a church without spot or blemish or any such thing. Faith really is the victory that overcomes the world. Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Habakkuk, Peter, John, Paul, Jude, their words were not in vain. We will be able to say, by the grace of God, we heard your words, brethren, and we overcame. Amen. <clears throat> when the people of God read about the judgments being poured out upon the earth, there is one judgment now in particular that we wait, that we desire to see, and that is the judgment of the great horror. <clears throat> With great desire... We long to see how the Lord is going to fulfill the words of his holy prophets spoken on this subject. The thought occurred to me that since the Lord is opening up so much of this to us now, it could be that we may see this very soon. It could be that the time of her judgment is now very near. So, brethren, in closing, I encourage you to be looking and ready for the Lord to fulfill his word. <clears throat> Although it seems like it has been a long time, it might be, seem to some that this is just the way things are going to be, <clears throat> but I remind you, he will render a recompense. <clears throat> Amen. Amen.